Gonna need a gap filler. Gonna need a puddle sucker too. Might also need a Jenny. And another Sanger. Whatever you need her, Coates High has a million pieces of equipment. Call 13 15 52. Welcome back to Pukekohe. We prepare for the third and final race of the day. And it wouldn't be a trip to New Zealand without the traditional haka. And today it is being performed by the Mania Kapa Haka Group. We're standing by. Fabulous performance, and shortly before that, there was a marvellous rendition of the Australian and, and New Zealand national anthems as well. Adding to the fabulous atmosphere here at Pookie, the crowd have been marvellous today. The racing has been top shelf all weekend, and we prepare for a third and final belt at it. And I think Neil Crompton, this will be no different to what we've seen with the previous two races. No question that we're going to have a very spectacular race. Uh, if the first two are any guide, here's the point situation after two races and Greg Murphy in command with two race wins, four points ahead of Russell Ingle. Mark Scaife in third position with 118 points and down through the order. The interesting question mark at the moment is what will the weather do? It's gradually been getting a little more overcast throughout the course of the day and he's hoping those showers stay away. Daryl. Uh, but in the second race, she had a collision with Brad. Brad rolled over. Can you give us your view on the incident? Um, yeah, Baz. I mean, it was it was an unfortunate thing that happened, and um, uh, it, personally, I don't want to do that or put anybody in that situation. We're supposed to race hard, and you know that's what we're doing. And uh, I'll tell you what, you know, it was a terrible feeling to see the car upside down as I came into the pit lane, um, especially knowing that somebody that I am very close to was driving it. Um, so it was, you know, it was a terrible thing for, uh, to happen, basically. Have a good fight from 21st. Cheers, mate. Thanks a lot. For the HSV dealer team so far this weekend, it's been a, a case quite often of all the good work coming undone, Garth Tander. What happened to you in that second race? Uh, what well, didn't happen to me in that second <laughs> race? Um, no, I got caught up in, in that first, first time down into turn three and um, got a bit of damage on the front of the car, which we thought we survived. And then about uh, 10 laps later, one of the seals started to fall off and we basically, the officials told us we were going to get black flag, so we figured we'd come in while the safety car was out and rip the seal off, but it put us all the way to the back and we had a fair bit of catching up to do. They're clearing the grid down here, guys. You're on road 20, or road 10, I should say, P20. Good luck. Thanks, mate. Cheers. Yeah, Garth Tander has been one of those unlucky ones where he's proven on a couple of occasions this weekend that his car is definitely one of the fastest in this field but he's just been in the wrong place at the wrong time. Reminding you, too, that something new we've got going for the 2005 season is the Zinger Hot Topic, and we encourage you to visit the website, rpmlive.tv, and click on the Zinger Hot Topic button and email us what you would like us to talk about. This week's winner was Robert Spudafora from Doncaster. He asked Neil Crompton, is... Are the limited test days really saving the team's money? And your short answer, Neil? Uh, well, it's a little bit difficult to answer that one because it's a long and complicated subject, but uh, probably not. People spend money in motor racing no matter how many test days you have. 
whether it's a lot or a little. Um, what it does do is it forces teams to do more bench testing and simulated testing and they find other ways of making speed in the cars. There's probably a little bit of a push on at the moment to perhaps uh, extend the days. One of the great things that has happened though is that the race meeting practice times have been extended. We mentioned that earlier and on Fridays at the race meetings and at this particular race meeting it was extended out to two hours. It gives the teams and drivers great opportunity to fiddle with the cars show the cars off to the public in full flight and that's great news and so to some extent that alleviates some of the difficulties with the reduced testing days. So once again rpmlive.tv click on the Zinger Hot Topic button and Neil and myself will discuss that Zinger Hot Topic at the next round which is of course Barbagello in Perth. We look forward to seeing you all over there in three weeks time. The cars roll, race three, round two of the championship. This is the Talon Tough Tools grid and Greg Murphy as a result of winning the previous race starts from the pole position and we roll through. Several people have made significant progress, most notably Stephen Richards coming from the back of the pack up inside the top 10 and another big mover was Craig Baird also from the back of the field into 12th in his WPS Falcon. Some relief there. How do you do that? How does Richards, how does Baird come from so far back to be up as high as they do on a tight twisty track like this? Well first of all you've got to have good car speed but you've also got to have great presence of mind on a tight tricky racetrack like this one Lee and you've got to look out for incidents, you've got to think ahead of your car, understand what's going on up the road. There are days where you just seem to be always in the right place at the right time and the result will come to you. Of course there's the opposite of that as well where there are days where everywhere you stand lightning seems to go off and uh, but Stephen Richards a great performance in that second race to just come through from the back from 28th I think it was from memory and has come back up into the top 10 and uh, you can't do that by accident you've got to concentrate on it think about it there's some notables up the back Brad Jones Todd Kelly with the Todd Kelly car they've uh, replaced lots of little bits and pieces there they had to replace the radiator and the radiator ducting in that car also the front spoiler obviously, the headlights and headlamp brackets, all the brake ducts, the airbox was damaged as well and they had to give it a big wheel alignment. But talking about big wheel alignments, this car here, which was laying up on its side against the fence on the outside of turn six after race two, the BOC gases crew have worked hard between events to make sure that that car is safe and sound again and ready to contest this third and final race. A lot of panel damage down the left hand side of the car, fortunately not a lot of structural damage on that car. Clouds are starting to roll in. It's been pretty much the same temperature all day long, fluctuating a few degrees here or there, but around about the 20 mark. It's been very comfortable, uh, to be honest with you, all this weekend here in New Zealand. Weather a lot better than what we had expected. Yeah, we had a solid cloud cover for the last hour or so, though, and it's brought the ambient down to 18, the track temperature 24. We've had clear conditions for the rest of the weekend. Mark Scaife, who had a massive flat spot on that front right tyre after the big lock-up when he went down the inside of Russell Ingle in the second race. They replaced the outside tyres. We question marked whether or not he'd have a problem with the front right. Rob Starr said that Mark's initial call was that it wasn't too bad, but he then, as he explained to Greg earlier, flat spotted it again. The big mark on the tyre when he locked the brakes aggressively, and uh, so he was very fortunate to be able to get through to the end of the race without that thing popping and throwing him into the fence. The final cars coming into position and you'd have to say it's almost a capacity crowd here at Pukekohe. There were some question marks over whether this would be the final race at this venue. That's yet to be determined. We may come back to Pukekohe next year. It may be in Wellington. Stay tuned. We'll have more news by the time we get to Barbagallo in Perth. A couple of good stouches to keep an eye on here. Remember that yesterday Lowndes and Ambrose got together. Well, they're quite close on the grid again now. And I'm sure that uh, Craig's got the eyes on. Revs rise, final event of the day of the weekend. Can Murphy get the hat trick? Watch the inside car, will Ingle get the jump like he did in two? It's an even start. It's a drag race now. Ingle comes across, but Murphy's got the jump. Cleanly. Now look at this Lounge on the inside. He's pushing Ambrose wide, and that's payback for yesterday. It sure was. No question about that, but here comes Ambrose. He's trying to arrest the speed of the car. He's all out of shape, turns it back in, and uh, he's holding on grimly with Radisich down the inside. Radisich holds position. Now Scaife up on the inside of Ambrose. Two wheels in the dirt, and he runs down the side there, mirror to mirror down the back straight. And Ambrose, awkwardly positioned out there, now drops into position. The gloves are off. They are serious now. And there's some things to square up. Lowndes has forced his way to third. Radisic is forced out, pouncing on Ambrose like you wouldn't believe. 
Well, I did say that uh, Lowndes had had the eyes on, and about 10 seconds after that, he makes contact with Ambrose at just the critical moment to make sure that Marcus was sliding around in the marbles. He's got a bit of work to do now. He's in behind Mark Scaife, standing lap time 62.5 for Murphy. Margin 0.3 of a second to Ingle. Lowndes to third. Radisich, Scaife, Ambrose. Stephen Richards, a good start. Bow. Actually, Scaife had a fairly tardy start once again. He had to really claw back some ground. He will not enjoy seeing that Team Kiwi Commodore in front of him. He's working the back of Radisich. Radisich is doing everything he can to unsettle Lowndes. Meanwhile, out in front, Murphy skipping away. So too is Ingle. Can the rest of the pack go with them? Headlights Look at Ingle on. now. Headlights on for Scaife, looking at the inside of Radis issues, also looking down the inside of Lowndes, and he's got him. And Scaife will get into this as well. They're side by side on the run to six. Remember, compulsory pit stop in this third race as well. The window opens between laps five and 35, and it's only for tyres. That's why the green lights are on at the moment. Radis ish with Lowndes breathing on the back of him over the top of the hill. Already the leaders have skipped away. Keep an eye on Radisic during this race. They didn't have many good tyres left for this last race. They have one good one for the left rear, so we'll watch him. Which means that he's probably going to battle once everybody normalises tyre temperature and pressure. Thank you, Daryl. Talking with the Stone Brothers team in between race two and now, they said if Murphy makes a change, a minor change, and it's in the wrong direction, if we make one in the right direction, look out because Russell has got his measure. We ride with Lowndes though. Problems for Stephen Johnson. His day is done. Yeah, he's trying to drag that car home. It's got big damage. Must have been something up at the hairpin, I'd say, for him on the previous lap. He's at the pit entry now. Ambrose down the inside of Stephen Richards, who's up on the ripple strip. John Bow's in there as well, and Bow's done the fastest lap of the race so far. Side to side. Very difficult to do through turn six. That is a brave place to do that, John Bow. He got a top ten result in the last race. He wants better this time. Tire management is critical, and Daryl's alluded to that. Who's got what for this last race? Not only for this first sector of the race, but what have they got to fight on for the balance of the race after they take their compulsory stop? Breathing space between Radisic and Lowndes now. What's this thing a replay of? Further back in the pack. Stephen Johnson, is it? Look further to the left. There it is. And it was Trat and one of the WPS cars that got together, and Stephen Johnson, it was David Bernard, the WPS car, and uh, Stephen Johnson was an unwitting participant in that. 56-6 fastest lap now for Russell Ingle. He's sweating on the back of Murphy, who's starting to look a little vulnerable. 0.3 of a second was the margin last time through. Fastest second sector of the race so far for Greg Murphy as they run towards turn six. At the end of race two, Russell Ingle thought he may have had an opportunity to get Greg Murphy. Ingle has never been this close to Murphy in any of the races. This is a positive sign for the Caltex Ford. Just walked into the Stone Brothers pit bunker and the look I got was one of bad timing. We're real busy in here right now, but I can tell you, Ross Stone rolled his eyes like, whoo, it's game on here. Game on, all right, look at Ingle rides the back of Murphy. There's space behind Russell Ingle. There's no immediate pressure. It's a one-on-one -on -one fight, Murphy and Ingle. 56-5 for Greg Murphy last lap, and he was only two one-thousandths of a second quicker than Russell Ingle. You can't get much closer than that. Russell having a long, hard look under brakes at turn five. Two guys, enormously talented, different manufacturers, but they share the common goal. Neither of these two guys have ever won the V8 Supercar Championship Series. It's on their list. They want to do it in 05. Some strengths and weaknesses in both cars, but the lap time net position is about the same. You can see how much Murphy's car is moving around at the final turn. One more lap is clicked away. 0.3 is the margin. Replay now at the start. And you can see, pretty obvious, a bit of contact between the 888 car and the SBR car. Marcus just stayed on the gas, bounded back across the road like a motocrosser, and came back on to take a spot just alongside Paul Radisich. And they did a little bit of panel rubbing on the way up the back. They're the DJR West Point team going to recover Stephen Johnson. There he is, stranded over there. Wow, what a frantic start. The pit window is now open. Will we see the front runners dive or will they stay out? It's only compulsory tyre changes. No fuel in this event. Problems at Pukekohe further back in the pack and it involves Garth Tander. We spoke to him at the beginning of the race before the green. And he said, I've been in the wrong place at the wrong time, and he's there again. 
needs to join the armed forces. He's been in the wars all weekend. He's just had trouble all weekend, every single race. Just so unfortunate because he had a very quick car, qualified well in fifth, then got shoved to the back of the grid, and that was where all the trouble began. Compulsory stop, okay, go, go, go. done and dusted for John Bow. Fastest lap of the race, 56.48 for Greg Murphy. So it looked like rear tyres only for John Bow. Here's the incident in replay with Garth Tander being involved here, getting a touch, I think, from Paul Morris. That was an angle from the inside. And then, of course, when we came out of the break, you saw Garth coming back from this angle here, back on the outside. Here we go again. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that uh, that's been contact with Morris. Don't think anybody else was involved with that. And around goes Garth Tander. And, cool, there'll be uh, Ivory coming off those teeth of his. He'll be gnashing them together. It's been one of those weekends for him. Now... Jason Bride has got in the middle of Greg Murphy and Russell Ingle here. And has separated these guys. Bride has obviously come in for his compulsory tyre stop. And uh, Phil Keat and Jason on occasion have run long in these races, but today they've gone the other way. It's often traffic dependent. Russell's got hot tyres. He should, in theory, be able to sneak up the inside here. Bride was in Lee. He was in and just took two tyres down the left-hand side. So he gets the job done, but he didn't do it easily. He had to work pretty hard to go by. That's uh, Brad Jones taking his stop. Car number 21, compulsory tyre stop is done for Brad. And I think uh, Bright has forgotten to switch the compulsory pit stop light off on the Ford Performance Racing car. The actual time, Neil, that the car spent for the stop, they only changed rear tyres on Bradley's car, it was 4.46 seconds, but it did struggle to gain momentum as it left pit lane. A little bit of a helping hand from the boys. It's sometimes very difficult to launch them, particularly if the engine is a little bit uh, fluffy in its power delivery at low throttle percentage, and you've got to kind of coax them into action. WPS car in the gravel trap there is David Bernard, 48, involved in an incident the previous lap. What happened this time? Oh boy, on his own, ma major moment here. It's got a punctured front right tyre. Did that happen before or after? So was it flat or going flat? It'll be to do with the contact, you know, on the previous lap, because that was the side of the car, I think, that made contact with uh, Garth Tander. They all dive for the pits. We're expecting a caution. It's uh, on board here with Scaife, watching Lowndes, getting ready for... Well, that doesn't make sense, does it? Not supposed to be, they're both supposed to be doing 40 kilometres an hour. That's what pulled me up in the tracks there. <laughs> Looking at Stephen Richards here, Castrol Perkins. This is the Lowndes car. Lowndes of service, he's gone. Well done, mate, nice job. And Lowndes got out in front. A poor wheel. A poor wheel was, yeah, that yeah. confused me a little. I thought it was Murphy. I knew where you were heading then. I thought, boy, that's slick work if that's the case. Yeah. Look at that beautiful drill routine, Greg. 3.93 seconds was all it took for the super cheap auto team to complete Greg Murphy's stop. They changed the rear tyres. Oh, it is Bedlam down here. Todd Kelly drag racing with Barguana. They're all line astern. Kelly doesn't want to yield. He's going to have to give way here to get back in the queue. They're all line astern. Difficult when everyone stops at once. Lowndes was a terrific stop. He managed to get it done and out of the front of a freight train of about six cars. Otherwise, he would have had to wait. That, that's a very awkward scenario that was happening there to Todd because when the cars are line astern, as Greg pointed out, you just you're compelled to drive down the manoeuvring lane and because you can't get back in. Often what ends up happening is you've got to just virtually stop, find a gap and then go. But of course that mutilates your race and that's the reason the drivers are reluctant. What compounded it too, Neil, is that Marcus Ambrose had to slowly make his way down the lane at less than 40 k's an hour because he was waiting for Russell Ingle to complete his stop at the same time as Murphy. He had to wait for Ingle to leave before Ambrose could venture in, and I think there may have been a little bit of a concertina as a result of that. And the reason they've all dived in is the minute they saw the Bernard car up there, they instantly thought back at... Uh headquarters in each of the teams there was going to be a safety car which hasn't been deployed at this stage and that's why there's so much congestion in the pit lane i'm a little surprised not to see the safety car out yet well it's in a, quite a dangerous but spot isn't very. it but they might be hoping that the car can be moved without having to intervene with a tow vehicle or what have you but obviously uh, race control have got a better view of that than we have at this point so they're back up to full speed and in the shuffle 
Max Wilson leads this race from Paul Morris and Jamie Wincup. There is the stranded WPS Falcon of David Bernard, and it is in a very precarious position, right at the end of the back straight on the outside of the hairpin. Generally speaking, the race director, Tim Schenken, uh, is always nervous about cars that are in proximity like that for fear of having, a, uh, obviously, a very nasty incident where a car can cloud a stationary car at high speed. But there may be something else that they know that we don't at this point. These two are at it hard, Scaife and Lowndes. It's Adelaide all over again. Mark Scaife was all oh, over the oh, back oh, of him and Lowndes oh. is being blocked by someone up ahead. And is that someone, it's Paul Radisic? Scaife's trying to get the slingshot here so that he can uh, give himself better exit space. You know, he's got a few Ks here on Lowndes. He definitely was able to pick up the throttle a bit early, but I don't know that it's going to be enough. He's got speed on him, but Craig will go down the inside. Scaife sizes him up. No, he Lowndes didn't. stays wide. Scaife's good on the brakes. This is where he made an error, though, in race one. Uh, Not quite close enough. And in the back of Mark's mind will be the front right tyre that he had to finish the last race on, which went ka-chunk, ka, -chunk, ka, -chunk, ka -chunk the whole way home. And uh, he thought about it. I was surprised then. I thought Craig would go defensive, but he's decided quite wisely that the, the fastest way is on the clean race line and give yourself the normal and fastest advantage through that corner, which is stay on line. Well, I'm with the man who's at the head of the WPS V8 supercar team, Craig Gore, yourself, and Ian Warburn have been over to have a word to the officials here in pit lane. You're concerned about the car. Oh, man, the car's in a very dangerous position. You can see where it is sitting on the track. He can't get it out, and they won't pull a safety car. It's just rank stupidity, mate. It really is. Thank you, Craig. No problem. It is somewhat surprising, because it's right at the end of the back straight where they're doing their highest speeds. And there is Bernard. He's stranded. Both tyres are off that car. You see that? Yeah. The right rear as well as the right front. And the safety car has now been deployed. So, yeah, I'm very surprised that that uh, didn't happen earlier. There may have been a reason for it. And uh, that'll compress the field now and it'll reinvigorate a few battles. Oh, dear. More oh. trouble here. Big Bar trouble Bar here for Jason Barguana. Canal. Jamie just got hit in the steering, going up the back straight, the thing just broke. Um, so she's just turned hard left in the fence, going up the middle of the back straight. I'm OK, I'm just getting out. Voice of Jason Barguana, and that is at just in the kink in the back straight on the run between four and five, where in the previous race you saw all that other drama. Look at that. Would have got the attention of the boys on the marshalling point there. They've all ducked for cover, and uh, the splitter was already off the car, and I'm wondering whether it went under a front tyre. That happens sometimes if the under tray goes under the front of the car. We'll have a look at the Zinger replay, might tell more of the story. Where are we here? There he is, he's on the outside. He's made contact, aha. Uh -huh. Ah, it's clipped it. Made contact with uh, Jason Richards. Front right wheel already looked pretty weird there. And see, the whole split has gone under the front of the car. Oh, and the whole the radiator intake, everything, a big mess. Let's see whether or not uh, more of it goes under the front tyre or whether it's something just breaks. How long are we going to see that shot for? I wonder whether or not uh, you had a mechanical failure or something just went under the tyre. No, we're not going to see it. Don't know, inconclusive, but anyway, it's as a result of the Jason Richards contact on the exit of that corner, and that man there is the one that has to write the check, which is a bit frustrating for him. Been a tough weekend for them. He certainly has. He's been glued to that entire replay sequence. Mark Larkham, did Jason indicate the replay wasn't quite conclusive? Did it fold underneath? Yeah, he just said uh, during that incident he got a whack on the steering, and when he was halfway down the back chute, the uh, car pulled hard left, and... Uh, Put him in the wall. Unfortunate, but uh, that's the game, huh? Gee, it has been a hard weekend for you boys, and now a lot of repair work before we stick these things back on the boat to Australia. Yeah, there is, mate, but uh, one of our best qualities is bouncing back, and uh, this will put us to the test. Thank you, Mark. Cheers, mate. Bargwana has had a tough time at the beginning of this season. No points scored from the Adelaide race, and just a few here in New Zealand. So he is starting way behind the eight ball. Under safety car conditions here at Pukekohe, round two of the V8 Supercar Championship Series. And Greg Murphy is the race leader over Russell Engel and Craig Lowndes, Mark Scaife, Paul Radisic, Bow, Stephen Richards, Steve Ellery, Ambrose and Wilson, the top ten.
I'm confused because Jason Bright is at the head of this queue and I don't know why that would be at this point. He has performed his compulsory pit stop. A little bit of debris left there from Jason Richards. Dodo Commodore as Paul Morris exits pit lane. And they have waved Jason Bright by, okay. have they? Yeah, right. Now it's going to sort itself out. Yep. They're starting to wave them through now. So they had to contain the field for a while before they could release those that needed to be unwound to get back on the same lap and back into the correct positions. Yeah, you picked it up, Neil. I was just outside the Triple Eight garage and Roland Dane just arrived out and he said that safety car is in the wrong spot for sure. Also, an interesting point with uh, some of those flat tyres this weekend, there's been some valve stem issues with uh, tyres leaking pressure, so I wonder what's going on there as well with some of those cars. That um, has happened here a couple of times, I think, from memory. And one of the things that uh, can happen here is it's quite easy to damage the tyres on the back of the kerbs around this track. This would be the most aggressive that any of the drivers get on kerbing probably anywhere in Australasia. I mean, we saw shots in the first and second races where drivers have got all four wheels and tyres in the grass. Guys, we've just had a report from a colleague of ours from TV1 here in New Zealand who has just left the circuit and has gotten as far as the motorway, seven kilometres from the circuit, and it's teaming down. So everyone keeping an eye on the skies at the moment. Interesting to intercept some radio chat there from car one. Marcus Ambrose chatting at length with his engineer Paul Forky as well. He does not sound too happy with the, uh, the handling or performance of that car at present. Isn't it fantastic when you're nice and dry in the commentary box, Lee? And those poor pit reporters mm. who get so wet. Glad I made the choice to be up here. <laughs> so the uh, order on the computer now and the order that you see on the screen all looks about right. And there's the man that Greg was just talking about down in ninth place on the computer at the moment. Greg Murphy, Russell Ingle, Craig Lowndes, Mark Scape, Paul Radisich, John Bow having a good run. Stephen Richards, Steve Ellery, Marcus Ambrose, Max Wilson. That's the top ten. After all of his troubles earlier, Andrew Jones is twelfth. And this will be a very lively restart with all these guys bunched back up and having another crack at it. And always been the hot spot moments in these races when they reignite after a safety car period when they're so closely bunched. Reminding all of you who have spent more than $30 at a super cheap auto store, if you've already entered into the V8 Supercar uh, Muscle Car Mania competition, well, here's your chance for some more bonus entries. Simply SMS the code on Murph's dash. If you can't see it, there it is on the screen. It's SV8. And what you want to do is text it in as many times as you like. For Australian viewers, SMS 1977 5151. And for all of you here in New Zealand, SMS 8844. This week's winner will receive a Holden SV8 Commodore valued at $45,000 plus an extra five grand super cheap auto products. Good luck. Keep on texting. And the clouds are looking a little more angry above Pukekohe. There's uh, another replay of the incident involving Jason Barguana and Jason Richards. Richards gets underneath him at turn four, and then they make that contact there. Just on the exit of the corner, it takes away a big chunk of the front splitter on the car, on the number 20 car. And then as he heads off up the back straight, something breaks or a little bit of the carbon fibre goes under the front tyres. Couldn't ask for a better group for a stoush in the last race of the weekend. Murphy, Ingle, Lowndes, and there is Stephen Johnson, day done. He's endured a fairly similar weekend to Garth Tander. Signs and hopes of brilliance, and then he's been in the wrong place at the wrong time, and it started right back in the first session where he spun several times, and it wasn't his fault. There was dirt and rubbish put on the circuit right in front of him where he had no choice in it. The car's still and sitting And they're there. quite slow to retrieve this vehicle. Where is the, where's the flatbed or where is the tow truck? This is agonising. Nowhere in sight. Oh, it's because of oh, the Barguana. incident. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is still dealing with the car halfway up the back straight and probably some damage to the fence there as well. So the uh, flatbed truck has now been deployed. David Bernard is out of the right pattern Shakespeare Falcon. His weekend has come to a premature ending. But his teammate Craig Baird is still in it. Two 
separate incidents here at Pukekohe to be cleaned up. David Bernard and Jason Barguana. The officials are attending to that as Max Wilson dives for the pits. There is the Orcon Falcon of Barguanas retrieved and heading back to pit lane and some lengthy work for the Larkham Motorsport employees ahead before they ship that boat off back to Australia and to Perth. And every lap that winds down here with the cars not at racing speed, those tyres are cooling out. They're losing tread face temperature and the tyres are also pressuring down, which means when they go back to racing, they're more likely to be harder to control. Here is the thing that triggered all this to begin with, which is Bernard getting out of shape under brakes at the end of the back straight and then ultimately parked up with two flat tyres on the edge of the sand trap. Mechanical black flag will be shown to Jason Richards for the bodywork that's all been rattled loose on that car after the contact at turn four with Jason Barguana. Obviously pretty disappointed down here. Wally Story says sometimes I'll come here and I'll have a good weekend, but that car showed terrific pace throughout qualifying, but they've had a disappointing race this weekend. New engine for Jason Richards. They did have high hopes, didn't they? Yeah, I spoke to Jason uh, just before the start of the race and he said, oh, mate, I, I don't even feel like my championship started yet. I just keep having weird things happening. And they, uh, they dropped a cylinder in the previous race and they're very pleased with the speed of the car. They got it into the top 10. And uh, at some point, obviously, you can put that stuff behind you and you have a good weekend and you try and deal with it from there. But certainly uh, copping some bruises right at the moment. He won't feel too much better either because after the first two races of this weekend, he lies 31st in the championship. Well, a lot of work to do to get the Dodo Commodore back up there. Still under yellow here at Pukekohe. We'll resume racing shortly. The WPS safety car leads Greg Murphy around. And with every lap completed under yellow, Greg Murphy is another lap closer to that triple head victory. And problems for the Longhurst. Wow, Commodore of Max Wilson. Looks a bit ugly, doesn't it? That's uh, losing water, steaming away there. So they're going to put that on the go jacks and take it back into the garage. I think the day's done there for Max. It's busy boiling tea, so that's not good for him. And he's been pretty strong all weekend, which is a shame. Got, got himself into the top ten. Here he is talking to Oscar Fiorinotto. In the meantime, guys, I'm at the other end of the lane. I've tracked down Dave Ward, the technical director at Super Cheap Auto Racing. You've been in long consultation with the officials. Tell us why. Yeah, Greg, what's happened? Um, this happened last year as well. What happened was there was an accident on the circuit. The pace car was deployed on the grounds of safety, which it should be. But what happens is they leave the pit lane open. So the guys that haven't done the pit stops come in during that pit stop. They haven't picked up the leader and uh, it gets very confusing. We've lost four spaces. You're talking about Paul Wheel here. Paul has lost four spaces. Yeah, Greg's easy because he's at the front. So uh, the pace car picks him up. Paul was down 11th and we're now 15th. Um, that's a little bit confusing how that happened under a pace car because no one should be overtaking anyone. So what they really need to do is try and do the FIA regulation where when the pace car is deployed, they shut the pit lane until the train behind the pace car is in the race order, then you open the pit lane. That would save the confusion. Very quickly, your other driver, Greg Murphy, has been on the radio doing a bit of uh, meteorological surveying, hasn't he? He thinks rain might be on the way. Yeah, I think uh, I think we're going to be all right. We looked at the radar and we, we should be OK to the end of the race. But um, he's the local boy, so we should listen to him. Thank you. No worries. And Dave Ward is a guy you should listen to when you talk about endurance racing and pace cars and safety cars and caution periods. His background is in endurance sports car racing with Team Bentley and the Velox Audi squad that were victorious at Sebring and Le Mans. And very successful. And it's great to have him here in Australia. laps are in the bank 50 laps the journey it's an awful lot of racing to go and uh, notwithstanding what uh, Dave Ward just said and he's obviously as you pointed out Lee well experienced and he knows the game well I tend to listen to Greg Murphy when it comes to understanding the local weather conditions and if he's on the <laughs> phone bluing about how ordinary it might be I, I reckon that uh, he could be right it looks very murky on the horizon Have you seen his new television commercials? That is Greg Murphy. No, I've heard about them. <laughs> They're aired here in New Zealand. And I saw one last night, and I can't wait until we're able to run one on V8 Superstars or the, our RPM program because he's in for a serious I said to him, I said to him before, our producer's trying to get hold of some of these commercials so we can bring them back to Australia. And he said, no, no, don't bother. Don't bother. Don't. 
the fleece, though. Zinger replay of first lap incident between Lowndes and Ambrose. Yeah, we only saw it uh, a little late then, so contact actually was just being made. It started a little bit further back than that, but uh, all fairly self-explanatory. Craig had the eyes on. He was in the position this time to make sure that his car was pretty wide and awkward for Marcus, and that's what he did with it. Radisic was opportunistic there too, Peter, wasn't he? Ducked up on the inside. And lane now, over. Some sprinkles in the lane here, guys. Very, very faint. Everyone keeping a, a close eye on it. I've just been down to the Stone Brothers pit bunker and had a word to Paul Forgey, who works, of course, on Marcus Ambrose's car. Now, they're a bit perplexed as to what this problem may be. They've looked at the times, the lap times, over the last few hot laps prior to the safety car, and Marcus, they believe, was still able to bank times and match it with Russell Ingle and with Greg Murphy. They feel he may be just up tight in the queue right now. Well, it's going to get... Pretty difficult for him in the coming laps because he's surrounded by cars, so he has to stay cool. The battle continues in just a moment. We're back at the best possible time. Safety car has exited the circuit and Murphy puts his foot to the floor with raindrops starting to fall here at Pukekohe. Murphy leads the field and he's got an early jump on Russell Ingle. Back to racing. And we've got to pay close attention to turns two, three and four back in the pack because I'm sure it'll be willing back there. Murphy on cold tyres looks strong already with a 40 or 50 metre gap as they sprint away and the resumption of play. Lowndes was able to go with Ingle and he dropped Scaife off a little. We'll see if Scaife can respond as the drag race up the back straight begins. Approaching the halfway mark of this third and final race at Pukekohe. Well, they got through there pretty cleanly, surprisingly. They just about all did it single file, not side to side. Generally after a restart is when the chaos unfolds. Richards, Richards on the inside of Bow. He's trying to follow Radisic who has heavy damage on the front on the bonnet of his Team Kiwi Commodore. Pretty clean first lap. Slick, fast. Very unusual. Not a bad time for Greg Murphy. 56-5 Lee and uh, on tyres that had cooled out, that's pretty impressive. 6-8 for Ingle, 7-3 for Lowndes, 7-4 for Scaife, 7-5 Radisich, 7-5 Richards. Looking further down to Ambrose, it was a 7-9. So he certainly didn't have the pace of the key guys in that first lap. There he is. And Jamie Wincup, the young Victorian, in only his second full-time season in V8 Supercar Racing, enjoying another solid drive. The positional changes. They line up for a shot. Scaife goes the outside this time into the hairpin and has a good look at the 888 better electrical Ford of Craig Lowndes. Stay on board with Mark and have a listen and watch this battle. Scaife gets Lowndes. Easily done. He came off the corner strong and Radisich goes through on the Castrol car as well. Now Lowndes arguing side by side through oh! six. This is going to get sticky. Oh, he just gets out of it at the right time. He is very, very brave, Craig Lowndes. But Scaife won that arm wrestle. Mark came off the corner well, and you notice they both pulled sixth gear at exactly the same time because you saw the puff of black smoke from Lowndes' car, and with the benefit of the hole being drilled in the air by the Falcon, Mark was able to come up the inside. And it did look like he had good straight line speed too. If Scaife can stay in this position, that would solidify a podium result for the weekend for Mark Scaife. Just a wipe of the... Windscreen wiper on Scaife's car there as well. It might have been just to clean the screen because remember those onboard shots the previous lap showed us all that dirt and garbage coming up. It's on here again. Richards, Richards on the outside, Radisich on the inside, side by side. 
Oh. Contact. Well, Jason Barguana, give us a rundown of that incident. I guess we didn't see all of it. No, it has. I mean, it's when, it, uh, when it rains, it really pours, doesn't it? We haven't had any luck this year at all, but... Uh, yeah, Jason Richards fired down the inside and it's copped a big hit in the steering and uh, it's felt all right coming out of the corner. I've got to the, the kink in the back straight there and the car's just gone straight ahead. So I did everything I could, but she just veered, veered left and that was it. But, uh, geez, we just can't take a trick at the moment. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, guys. Just popped down to the Holden Racing Team garage there and spoke to Robbie Starr. He says no dramas for Mark Scaife and had a, just a slight little smile. He's not one to smile of late Robbie Starr, but uh, Scaife clearly on a mission. That's for certain. Now look at Richards. He's on a mission. He went outside last time. He thinks about inside. He's close now. Dives for the inside desperately at the last moment. But he can't force the issue here with Radisic. And the real temptation where Stephen is at the moment is to just nail the throttle in first gear when you come off the hairpin to try and lunge at the bloke in front. But you can't do that with that low gear or it'll burst into wheel spin. So even though you're tempted to want to have a dig at the, the fella in front, You've got to be patient. And the more you nail the throttle, the worse it gets. At the non-championship support races at the Australian Formula One Grand Prix, John Bow and Brad Jones for Team BOC enjoyed a 1-2. They were the only guys on slick tyres when everyone else went for wets. It was a lucky victory, but it was a victory nonetheless. However, we shouldn't ignore this effort from Bow now. This is genuine pace, and he runs seventh. Meantime, here's the battle up front. 0.4 was the measured margin last time. And it's brewing back here. There was a lunge there. What happens at the hairpin? They stay the same. Stephen Richards trying, trying all the time. Ellery's still in the mix. Oh, Bride looks at a run on Wind Cup. The FPV Caterpillar Ford working the back of the Dodo Commodore. We go on board now with Ambrose. Inside for Stephen Richards, turn one. Radisic Richards, the two Kiwis. That is tight stuff. Good move, Richards. That was a good move from Stephen, and uh, I'm surprised that Paul could hang on out there because, generally speaking, there's little in the way of grip. That next group of cars spells trouble. Lots of them close together. That point in the race where you're looking to try and do something, 21 laps to go. It was as though Stephen Richards was breathing a sigh of relief when he finally executed that pass. At about this point, one lap ago, he was on the radio. He sounded as though he was bluing about the fact that Paul Radisic, in his opinion, may perhaps have been blocking a little too strongly, and he wanted the team to get the officials to do something about it. Not a concern any longer. Marcus Ambrose would not enjoy being back in this pack. He's still in the top ten, but it's unfamiliar territory compared to the Clipsal 500. Look at Ellery trying to get bow. The Triple A Ford is strong, fighting the BOC Falcon. Meanwhile, Richards has been able to skip away from Radisic. Look at this, the boys just fully motocrossed through turn two. This is where the focus is at the moment. This battle, 56-1, last lap for Mark Scaife, the fastest of the race so far. We're riding with Marcus Ambrose. He's in ninth, right behind Steve Ellery. Ellery on the defence, now Ambrose on the dirty line that's hard to do up there. Oh, Ellery's got Bow. It Bow's going to lose two here. Ambrose runs wide, Bow goes back two spots. This is fierce racing. They will be absolutely wringing the necks of these cars. There's nothing left under brakes. They're maxing out on the tyres. They've everything they've got left to try and get a result. And the weather just looks ordinary out there now, folks. I'd be very surprised if it doesn't go downhill rapidly. It's very ordinary, Neil. He's coming across the paddock in front of me and towards pit entrance, so I'd say it's high of our conditions, probably. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Get your instruments out, Daryl. Because even from where we're sitting at the moment, looking back towards your pit lane, it looks pretty ordinary. It's dusty, the wind's picked up. Back at the front, it's still Murphy over Ingle. Less than a second in it. Scaife has been able to gap Lowndes. Huge gap back to Richards. And Ellery, Ellery on the inside of Radisic. Can't quite do it. There's some trouble in the foreground there too. We could see the blue smoke. It was uh, Stephen Richards, I think, locked a break late in the stop. And meanwhile, there's still more brewing in this little group here, isn't there? 
Look at the water on the windscreen of the Pertec Ford. Raindrops starting to get heavy now. Oh, look at that. A big, big moment for Ellery. Almost spills it wide with oversteer. Gets into the dirt. Oh, and so too, Wind Cup. They're all getting trapped by the lack of grip. Oh, Trouble. Dumbrell. Big shunt. Big shunt. Dumbrell and Baird. This Craig is going to be Baird. bad. This is huge. Lost the back off the Craig Baird car. This will be a safety car. If the red flag, red flag. The race will be stopped. Terrible situation. Boy, oh boy. They are going everywhere. And Cameron McConville, wrong place, wrong time. Brad Jones skips through. That's a shocking scene. Yeah, I thought you were through there. Now, is that Stephen or Paul? No, it's Dumbrell. OK, let's hope he's OK. Looks like he's getting out front, back side of the car. Everything absolutely destroyed. The back is missing off the Craig Baird car. And the race freezes. And that'll be it, I think, folks. Baird's trying to get out. Greg? He's talking. He's looking at the car. Just had a word to Keith Evers down at uh, WPS Racing and very concerned about his driver, Craig Baird. He's OK, obviously. He's been on the radio prior to getting out of the car. What was his take on it? Uh, he didn't say much. Uh, it just happened all of a sudden. But he, he's OK. That's the main thing. The car's trash, but he's OK. That's the main thing. Hard luck. Thanks, mate. There is going to be some unbelievable work required to get these cars in shape. Red flag at lap 31. And 75% distance, which is the declaration point in a race, would be 38 laps. But time could be another issue here. It's going to take a while to sort all that out. We'll crunch numbers and look at the regulations. The way it sits at the moment, you've got Murphy, Ingle, Scaife, Lowndes, Stephen Richards, Paul Radisich, Marcus Ambrose, John Bauer, Jason Bright, Stephen Ellery. That's the top 10. There's Murph. We'll have a replay and look at what happened. I can tell you that the grip was going away rapidly. The rain started to fall. They're on slick tyres. Ellery was the first to be trapped at the top of the hill. He gets out wide. Jamie Wincup's gone for all money here as well. He just completely slides off the road. And then as, he, as Baird comes back down the straight and Wincup comes back on, they make contact, I think, from memory. Here's the front shot. That's Ellery out wide. Watch to the left here, Neil. Dumbrell and Baird are on the far left of your screen. Here comes Wind Cup. And he traps Craig Baird and then Dumbrell down the inside. So they all move because of Wind Cup and then contact down here between Dumbrell and Baird. And then Baird whacks backwards into the wooden fence here, takes out the PA system. That's the horse racing track there on the left of your screen. Back is missing off the WPS car. That'll be close to a write-off. 400 grand, goodbye. And there is McConville. Came through, narrowly avoided. Paul Dumbrell and crunches the front of the Valvoline Repco Commodore. Uh, the standard procedure with a race is that if you've not reached 75% distance, which is whatever I've got here, set of 38 laps, I think it is, uh, then the race can't be declared. So the cars theoretically would go back to the grid at this point and there may still be some continuation of this race but that will depend on a bunch of circumstances international broadcasting requirements and just what state this field is in pretty shabby at the moment several of the cars there is a trash castrol perkins commodore of paul dumbrell the other thing that happens depending on the damage to the racetrack it it, it was going to be a huge job to repair some of the issues with the racetrack i should think which has slowed down the progress of events in the past. There's McConville's car, Gary Rogers Motorsport crew trying to turn that back into a Commodore. And the reason why there's so much desperation there is points. Points are so important in this V8 Supercar Championship now. Any points you can gain, and with this race not being at the required level for declaration, there's team owner Gary Rogers, Phil Curtis in there as well. They want to try and turn this car around and get it back out there. Wet weather tyres are being run out onto the circuit. Down into pit lane. And look at the scramble. Let's have another look. Zinger replay time at this craziness of Pukekohe. Eller is the first to get trapped, then wind cup. And once the grip disappears, you're a passenger in something over 200 kilometres an hour with one and a half tonnes underneath you. 
and then as Wincup comes back, the other two faint further to the right to try and give him space, but they make light contact. Not intentional on the part of either driver, just an unfortunate circumstance. And they make heavy contact and end up on either side of the road. But then other people get involved, and that's McConville. We were looking at his car in the garage before. He makes contact with the outside wall on the approach to turn one. That's a wet weather tyre there, fully grooved in the foreground, and the wets will be going on to all of the cars. Ford Performance Racing crew, the Cirame Wines crew. And, and the some... Raincoat crew. Yeah. Look at it coming down now. We almost got through this weekend. It's been beautiful weather, even last weekend Look at that. for the World Rally round. I was over here and the weather's been stunning all week. This is the first bit of daytime rain they've seen in quite a while. Some serious damage on Paul Dumbrell's car. If you want. Craig Lowndes. Well, as you guys ventured across the, the top of the hill there, you were pioneers. You could hear everyone very gentle on the throttle trying to gauge just how much traction there was. But this is a pretty difficult outcome. Well, it is, and, uh, and I guess it's sort of a shame in a sense because it's such late in the day, and we've got uh, obviously rain coming. We've had a big accident down here into Turn 1. It's very greasy, and we're all on slicks. No one knows what's going on, so it's, uh, it's a little bit of a confusion. It does sound like we're going to have a bit of a delay here. There's a bit of damage to that fence. Beyond that, how's your own car been during the race? Yeah, good. Uh, it wasn't quite as good as Scavey's on, on the restart there, and he got me, uh, but uh, the car was running well. We had a good clean gap in front of us and behind us, and uh, unfortunately, it was all going well. Obviously, the talking point for our viewers at home is going to be that first lap incident with Marcus. Give us your take on that. Well, I've got a, I've got a, a brilliant start, which is very unusual for me. Um, it's something I've been working on and making sure that's getting better and everything else. And uh, and really just sort of went side by side through turn one, cold tyres. We, we had contact a couple of times and he sort of disappeared and I don't know where he went. And then he just sort of reappeared going into turn two. So, uh, look, I'm sure they'll probably have a look at it. But uh, really for us, it was, uh, you know, I, I didn't think there was anything in it. Thanks, Craig. We'll let you get back to it. They're letting the army go here, boys, with all the uh, uh, all the gear. Just what these guys wanted to do at this stage of the day, at this stage of the weekend. It is busy. The crews are allowed to work on the cars, I believe. And uh, the wets are going on. They're reforming the grid as at the positions on lap 30. Four-wheel in discussion with Greg Murphy. Uh, there seems to be a little bit of discussion going on here about who's allowed on and who's not allowed on. That's Jason Bright. Yeah, mate, I'm with, uh, with Paul. Paul obviously was pretty good pace there early in the race, but you started to lose a little bit then. Is it mainly tyres? Uh, on the restart, uh, the guys in front locked up in front of me and I just couldn't avoid Mark and drive straight up the back. So she's a, she's a little bit shorter one side than the other, which is not helping on the handling front. Maybe, the, maybe this will be a blessing in disguise, maybe, I don't know. It's pretty good for this team when you consider how quick they can change shocks to a different setting. You think that's going to help? Uh, absolutely. If we can, um, you know, we can change the wet setup pretty damn quick, depending on what happens here, if they allow us to go and change or whatever. Um, we'll see. I've never driven in the wet, so we'll see what happens, Daryl. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, buddy. Paul Radisic there talking with Daryl Beattie and Radisic at the time the red flag came out. Sits in fourth position behind Scaife, Lowndes, Richards. Now why is Murphy and and, uh, and Wheel? Why is Murphy so far down the order? That's a little bit jumbled up there, isn't it? Did Murphy die for the pits when the when the rain started to fall before the red came out? You're assuming that I'm smarter than I am because I can't <laughs> work that one out at the moment. So, cleaning up on the track. Lee, I can answer your question. Greg Murphy, Russell Ingle and Marcus Ambrose all did dive for their pit box when they came in the field. Were then, of course, told to venture back out onto the, the straight here, Stephen Richards. Initially, it was a park for May situation. Now the teams have been allowed to go to work. Yeah, that's right. You know, if you guys do what... Uh, at the moment, it's definitely a wet track, so we'll, we'll, be, we'll be on wets. What's the feedback been from the, the Team Perkins crew as far as Paul is concerned in the car? I'm not really sure personally. They said someone was having an off or something and Paul was somehow involved in it. Um, but he seems to be okay. He was wandering back from the car and he, and he seemed okay. Quickly, your car had some good pace. 
Yeah, it's going good. It's going good. I was struggling a little bit to get past Paul Radisic, but uh, finally got by and then seemed to have the pace to be able to match the, the guys in front. Were you upset? You sounded on the radio like you felt maybe he was blocking a little too aggressively. Oh, he was, he was just, he was driving down the inside everywhere every time I, I was in a position to challenge and, you know, under the way we race, you know, it's not quite right and I was just making sure people were aware of it. Go and chat to the crew, get that car 11 right for the wet. Thanks, mate. Bye. That paints the picture perfectly. Plenty of clouds still around, but the rain has eased. The teams have been working overtime and the cars regridded in the format as per lap 30. We were on lap 32 and as per the operations manual, the rule book, they go back to lap 30. Greg Murphy, the race leader, starts from pole. And this has been judged. It will be a 16 lap race. All cars now with wet weather tires. And this will be a scramble. If you thought it was entertaining before, stand by. This should be interesting. This is one that'll uh, get you scratching your head, Lee, but I'm just reading the operations manual at the moment as we look at the wet weather tyre there on the DJR car in section D, stopping and restarting races, rule 9.3.2, other than the race order at the end of the penultimate lap before the lap in which the signal to stop the race was given. Are you following me? Yeah, gotcha. Uh, and the number of laps covered by each driver the original race will be deemed null and void. So other than the race order at the end of the penultimate lap before the lap in which the signal to stop the race was given, which is why we've backdated from 32 to 30, that part I get, the original race will be deemed null and void. So according to the way I read the rule book, then what we just saw for the last half or three quarters of an hour counts for nothing. And this will be a standalone race in its own right for 16 laps with a warm up lap. Right. I will get confirmation of that, but that's the way that I understand it when you read the rule book at the moment. And it might have more to do with me not understanding the rule book than the reality, but we will double check on that. Race is due to be started in the coming minutes. It has certainly been an eventful weekend at Pukekohe. Thankfully, the drivers involved in that huge crash are OK. Craig Baird and Paul Dumbrell, Cam McConville, who skipped through right at the end there, and it also was a lucky escape too for Jamie Wincup, who went off the track at a very high speed, was able to come back on, and then all hell broke loose after that. There's the man of the weekend, man of the moment, Greg Murphy. Starts from pole in this wet race from here on in, 16 laps. And he's got a round at stake, and Darrell is standing by. Murph, you've probably been in this situation. You're about 17 years old here. What do you do for the next 16 laps, wets or dries? Well, it's definitely wet, mate, at the moment. That, that, that new surface is unbelievably treacherous. Um, you know, and they're, they're going to give us one warm-up lap, which is very generous of them. <laughs> not. Um, yeah, it's not a great situation to be in, there's no doubt about that. I, I wish, uh, wish we'd um, managed to continue on in the dry, but this is what we got. Thanks, mate. Cheers. Yeah, he has some work to do. He has his hands full and he's got a hungry pack chasing him. In the background while you've been working there, Lee, I've uh, double-checked just to make sure of my facts, but what, what we did just see in terms of what we thought was the third race, the dry component of it, gone. So it means nothing, and this will be a fresh race three for 16 laps on the wets. And uh, very difficult conditions now. You can see how much water's on the road. They're on wet weather tyres. They're going to get one warm-up lap. They'll all have to feel their way around to see what sort of grip they've got. And, of course, there's huge potential here for more incidents. Yeah. And that'll be the tricky part now as the day winds down. And there's the wet. The idea of the wet is the rubber compound is softer than the dry. The grooves on it channel the water away from what was conventionally the slick face of the dry tyre. And uh, we saw in Melbourne in the non-championship round at the beginning of the year at the Australian Grand Prix. An extraordinary performance from the control tyre, which is uh, provided by Dunlop, just how well it hung on in dry and semi-dry conditions, and a couple of teams used it to their advantage. Neil, it's interesting. I just got a quick chat with Marcus on the grid while it was quiet there, and we were talking about the car, and he says there's something still in this car this weekend. I'm not happy with it since race two. I said, what do you think it is? Have you been through everything? He said, well, you know, it tends to maybe an internal with a shock, or he said it gets to a point when I turn in, it feels like maybe even a chassis rail or something like that, so it's interesting. Yeah, he's not been happy, has he, since uh, 
Well, a point through the race weekend. You know, we've heard the chat in the background on his radio and uh, have just been watching outside his garage and talking to some of their people and just haven't quite had the car that he's had on other weekends. But he's had such a terrific run. We're unaccustomed to seeing him in this position, but that's part of putting together a championship and he's got off to such a terrific start earlier in the year. He's still grinding away, getting points. And the main thing when you have one of these weekends, as you know from your Grand Prix motorcycle days, you've just got to try and not let emotion take control and stay focused, get home, dust yourself off and go, well, that was a fairly average weekend for various reasons, but no biggie. I've scored some points and I'll carry it with me to the next one and try and do better when we clean the slate. The worst thing you can do is let emotion take over, have a dummy spit, make a mistake on the track, DNF, and when you don't finish, there's just there's no joy at all. You may have noticed on the side of the Super Cheap Auto Racing Commodore there, Greg Murphy and a number of the cars are showing this sticker in memory of John Porter. We've lost two big supporters of this category, two people heavily involved over the last little while. We mentioned Louise Teasdale from Ford earlier and John Porter passing just recently. So commiserations to his family and he will be sadly missed in this community. You knew him very well too, Neil, didn't you? Yeah, John was a great guy, uh, another one of the unsung heroes, a very clever technical man that's worked uh, behind the scenes in many different categories in Australasian motorsport. A lot of friends in the pit paddock here and several of the cars in the field. Uh, very unfortunately uh, uh, acknowledging, but very kindly acknowledging um, John this weekend. We hate those uh, situations, but uh, Craig Lowndes has got a problem here. That car's not started and he hasn't left the line. So our thoughts are with John's family. In fact, neither of the better electrical Fords have left the line. There's Stephen Ellery, his teammate, forcing the rest of the field to squeeze through that gap very slowly. Are they doing this on purpose? A little bit more information to update here. The safety car will precede all vehicles at the start of this motor race, and the cars are going to start in single file. So because of the treacherous conditions, they will start behind the safety car initially build to speed the safety car will peel off and away they will go now they've got Stephen Ellery underway here they're going to bump start the Lowndes car or are they just going to drag it off to the side of the road they're taking it off the road well that is amazing isn't it staggering for Craig Lowndes after what should have been a fantastic weekend for him Now he's got everyone in pit lane helping him, trying to fire up the Triple Eight Better Electrical Falcon. They did it effectively with Ellery. It looks like to me they're going to direct him off the racetrack and out of harm's way. So they will be cursing back at the Triple Eight garage, and obviously something weird there. They haven't been able to start either of the cars under their own power. Meanwhile, the safety car is at the front of the pack the lights are blaze you can see how slippery that track looks at the moment there's no way known you can go out there on slicks without going straight into a fence so they're on the correct tire and next time they come around well in fact this time no they're going to send them again We'll grid up next time. I, I was going to say, I can't understand why the marshals are standing on the grid there because the message we got was they're going to start the race behind the safety car. So they won't be going back for a standing start. And I think the message is coming through now for yeah. officials to uh, leave their posts. So Craig Lowndes taken out of fourth place in this lineup. His teammate is now at the back of the line. This is where Lowndes was meant to slot into. And he is off the side of the circuit it's a weird sky there in the background isn't it there's some blue and there's a little bit of low cloud here and there it's just one of those showers that went through it it pelted down quite hard there just momentarily maybe 30 60 seconds but it's been enough to really throw some water around the racetrack because Ellery didn't start under his own power I reckon that he's going to be penalized uh, we've seen instances of that in the past We'll double check that and we'll just see what race control have got to say. See all these different surface changes, Lee. That's what's going to be hard for the drivers. Resurfacing, we've detailed that story over the course of the weekend. And the grip levels will change dramatically from one surface to the other. So when you've got your car right on the maximum braking limit, you found a level with your tyre, 
you put your foot on the brake and uh, you think everything's under control, you get to the next 10 metres of road and whoop, off she goes. And when one of these cars breaks away from underneath you, it's just an instantaneous moment. Oof, gone. Just down at the end of the, the lane with Craig Lowndes, he's out of the car, you've spoken to one of your engineers, what happened? Uh, it's got no power, no ignition, so uh, got no ignition, can't start the damn thing. So what are you going to try and do here now? You've just spoken with him, are you going to try and fire this thing up in some way and uh, get back out there? Well, hopefully. Thanks, Craig. I don't know that he's going to, even if they get it started now, I don't think he can rejoin because he wasn't there at the, effectively at the start of the race. He's been in the thick of it all weekend. He's been at the front. He gave the team its first ever V8 supercar pole, then was involved in an incident with Ambrose, had to fight his way back through the field, was at the front in the original start of race three, and now he is out of it. I just wanted to seek clarification there for a moment, Lee, as to whether we'd actually started the race and we were ticking out of the 16 laps, but I believe not. The lights are out on the safety car now. It'll peel off into the pit lane this time, and then we will go racing. And uh, that being the case, if Lowndes is not there when the race starts, then uh, it's game over for him. The lights are out on the right pattern Shakespeare safety car, as you can see. And we get into it for the final time here at Pukekohe. Murphy was very close to the hat trick, but now he has to do it all again. And expect every likelihood that this is going to be a little bit chaotic as everybody tries to find the grip and find their limits in very, very awkward circumstances. Murphy gasses it up. Here we go, green flag waiting. Crowd applaud, they're happy to see the action as they go through the final turn and onto the front straight and already they get squirrely. Russell Ingall got sideways. Murphy leads the pack down the straight. And when you're back in the pack here, even though the television camera doesn't kind of make it look like that. It's murky, the screen gets covered in a kind of grey-brown mist and it becomes very difficult to drive your car, point it straight, let alone race somebody else. They're all on tippy-toes here at the moment. None of them are too adventurous. They know that the tyre temperatures are at virtually zero, well, at least only ambient, and there's just no grip available, so they're just taking it super gently. Ambrose on Radisic. He's gone the outside line. It's a braking duel. Right-hand side of your screen is Ambrose. Radisic has the inside. No advantage there to Marcus Ambrose. Radisic holds position. Oh, both sideways. Equally so. Now Marcus tries the other option. The outside run. Side by side with Radisic through here. Won't work. And he thinks about it again. Yeah, real nail-biting stuff for Marcus. He just tried to find a way around the outside, but he couldn't do it. See, one part of your brain's programmed to race the other guy and the other bit's sort of trying to keep the car straight, pointed in the right direction. And you're learning, oh, and that's Ellery that they're rounding up. And you're trying to learn the limits around you, feel the tyre, feel the car, see what the track offers you. And each corner will be different around this racetrack at the moment. Ambrose again on the charge, Radisic to the right. Again, Paul Radisic for Team Kiwi will have the advantage, but look at the Stone Brothers horsepower here. Marcus with the eyes on. Good power down off the corner, and he's got a better corner exit, which has given him the advantage in a straight line. And this time, a cleaner manoeuvre by Marcus Ambrose. Got it done early. Paul probably had a little bit more wheel spin coming off turn four. There wouldn't be much between those cars in a straight line in the drive, but Marcus has just been able to do a better job off that tight second gear corner turn four. It's Murphy, Ingle, Scaife, Stephen Richards. That's the top four, but look at the lead. Greg Murphy's enjoying. It's more than one second in this 16-lap wet weather race. A 62-9 for Greg Murphy last lap. 62-6 for Mark Scaife. Scaife's done the fastest lap in the wet so far. Here we are. We're on board with Mark. He's in third at the moment, attacking Russell Ingle. He was 0.4 of a second quicker on the last lap than Russell. High intensity rain lights are illuminated on all the cars at the rear. That's just so you can see where they are in the murk. Look at Russell on the brakes pretty early at the end of the back straight relative to Scape. Oh, Scape, he nearly drilled him. He was so close to giving him a big whack in the back. 
board with Scaife. The fastest corner on the track. Oh, car 34, Andrew Jones around at turn five. Sixty-two one this lap for Murphy. Two three for Ingle. Two eight for Mark Scaife. Andrews making a big mission of this one. Two two for Richards. Two two for Ambrose. Second place, Russell Ingle in the Caltex Falcon. Richards is now right with Mark Scaife. He's got a good run out of turn four as well. Can the Castrol Commodore go with the HRT machine? And this has got a lot to do with use of the throttle what tyre uh, pressures you're running, what spring combo, anti roll bars, what are the shocks set like? Does the car work in these conditions which are completely different? Oh, contact! Completely different conditions to what they've dealt with all weekend. The cars have not been set around a wet condition at all. Car on the move, Neil, is Marcus Ambrose. He's starting to reel these guys in, Richards and Scaife. And some cars will just naturally have pace and others won't. And it'll get down. Just what we were talking about, and that was the communication to Stephen Richards. Ambrose is catching you. Marcus did a 61.5 on the last lap, so although he's been saying to people, including Daryl, that something wrong with the car in the dry conditions, he's monumentally faster than anybody else in the wet at the moment. 62.4 last lap for Murphy, 2.0 for Ingle, 2.8 for Scaife, 2.8 for Richards, a 61.5 for Marcus Ambrose. You lead him alive at that pace. A despondent Craig Lowndes has walked back to pit lane. Guys, they have worked right around this. Carl Stephen Richards on the go here. Nice move on the inside. Richards executes that, and Ambrose is there to pay out pounce as well. He draws alongside Mark Scaife. He's on the outside line. No, he's not. He's got Scaife already. He did it easily. He was in position virtually as he leapt off the corner, let alone getting to the next one. He's got a ton of pace, Lee. He's going to be able to do a big job here to make inroads into this leading group based on the speed from the last lap. Marcus Ambrose goes straight from Pukekohe to Auckland International Airport, straight to Los Angeles, and then over to the East Coast to Charlotte, North Carolina, to begin his NASCAR Odyssey. The Richard Petty driving experience is the first thing on his list in the next couple of weeks. And he'll have a lot more to tell us when we see him in Barbagallo. Now sizing up Stephen Richards. It's traction off the corners that's making a difference with this car. It's holding good mid-corner speed too, but he just rockets off the corners. Richards is the next one on his list. And Matthew White's in problem, in trouble here. And he will limp back to the pits. Day done for him, I would say. Back to it. This is the battle. This is where the action is. Murphy leads from Ingle. There they are up ahead. Ambrose got out of the groove then, Lee. He just got half a wheel width into the mirror shiny stuff. And look at how much time he lost on the back of Stephen over the top of the hill. Just got a bit excited at the wrong moment. A two flat for him that lap. Meanwhile, the others are in the ones now. 61-6 for Richards, 1-8 for Russell Ingle, 1-7 for Murphy. It might have been the case that Ambrose was just able to make the best of the conditions a lap or two earlier than the others, but they're now matching that pace he had two laps ago. This has given Scaife an opportunity to take a look at the Pertec Falcon. Scaife's immediately behind this car. And closing, there's a healthy gap back to Paul Radisic. Then it's John Bow, Jason Bright. Garth Tander has worked his way into the top ten, and that is satisfying for the lanky West Australian after a frustrating weekend. There is Tander, car 16, the best of the HSV dealer team Commodores. It's got very dark out there again, and it really dipped in the last 30, 60 seconds, and I think there's more rain on the way. Tander's putting in some very consistently fast lap times. And Greg Murphy, race leader. Remember we told you earlier about the carrot being dangled by the general manager of his hotel? <laughs> if he wins the round, he gets to stay in a $3,200 a night penthouse tonight. And Todd Kelly goes straight ahead at turn five. This has been a great weekend for Todd. And trouble here for Andrew Jones. I think that's just a replay of what we saw earlier. And 61.5 on the last lap. 
for Greg Murphy, and he has a 1.5 second lead. So Murphy's now matched that time that Ambrose did a couple of laps back. Marcus, meanwhile, 61.6. Richard's done a 61.3. They're all learning the conditions now and exploiting them. And uh, people are starting to vacate the track in their droves because of the weather that we can all see in the distance up behind the hairpin. It is as black as the ace of spades. Team Kiwi Racing Commodore of Paul Radisic. He can't have the lights on because there's duct tape all over the front of the car because the bonnet was so badly bent out of shape. This car built by Paul Morris Motorsport and Morris doesn't number his chassis. He does it with a letter. And this is chassis letter F in honour of Frank Gardner. 61-3 for Marcus Ambrose on the last lap. Fastest man in these conditions at present. Fourth on the road. Murphy, Ingle, Richards, Ambrose, Scape, Radisish, Bow, Bright, Tander, Wheel. That's your 10. Then Win Cup, Seaton, Todd Kelly, Jason Richards, Rick Kelly, Paul Morris, Winterbottom, Trap, Brad and Andrew Jones, 19 and 20. They've settled. The top half dozen or so. The only action here is Bright in the Cat Ford. For Ford Performance Racing, he is eating into John Bow. And Bright's had one of those weekends where it's been two steps forward, one step back. But he's been consistently around that top ten, so valuable championship points for Brighty. Hasn't been such a happy weekend for the Brightec team. We just saw Matthew White limping back to the pits. A fair groove appearing in the racetrack now, and it's almost a dry groove you can see there on the loaded side of the car through turn one. It's not even really dry, it's just less wet and it's about six inches wide, but will offer a reasonable bit of grip if you can find it. What you can't afford to do is slide too much and slide out of that tiny little groove. Six laps to go. Back at the front, there is the super cheap auto Commodore. Greg Murphy is just a handful of laps away from yet another quite clean sweep, and it will be four round victories in five years. Russell Ingle trying to hunt down Greg Murphy. The margin's one and a half seconds for the Caltex Falcon. And Ingle has done a very solid job this weekend. There'll be a, an amount of frustration there that he couldn't go with Murphy. He got close in race two, but three second places, valuable, valuable championship points. 61-1 for Marcus Ambrose on the last lap. Again, the fastest man of this leading group by a tenth or two here and there. Murphy, 61-2. Ingle, 61-2. Richard, 61-4. Ambrose, 61-1. Scaife, 61-3. As a result of Russell Ingle's consistency this weekend, after the second race here at Pukekohe, he's third in the championship. Lowndes was a non-starter, as we know, in this race. So Russell will push up even higher. Just having a chat with my colleague Daryl Beattie here in pit lane. Guys, this is wild. It is dark here in pit lane at the moment. I haven't experienced this at a race meeting in a long, long time. It's not a 24 hour, is it? I know. Well, the interesting thing is, is that television lies. Oh, you're kidding. Oh, you're but the iris of the camera lies, and it looks a lot lighter here on these pictures we're watching than what it actually is. That was Lee Diffie that said that <laughs> for anybody at Network 10 Management. 61 <laughs> 1 last lap for Greg Murphy. 1 1 also for. Stephen Richards and uh, they've now matched the pace that Marcus has been showing. I don't think much is going to change here unless somebody makes a blue. Four laps to run. And they will be pleased to see the chequered flag today, that's for sure. The rain got the better of them. The Pertec Ford. Can Marcus Ambrose do anything about Richards? Time is running out as we ride with Marcus. And that's the the nice direction in terms of the horizon. You should see what it looks like in the other direction. You might see that up the back straight when they're pointing the other way. And uh, it is so dark. From our commentary box, which is just off to the left down here, that's us on the left over there. It is so dark looking back toward the pit lane, you can barely see it at the moment. You should have tailed that off with no lies. <laughs> going there, you're on your own, buddy. <laughs> 60.8 that lap for Stephen Richards, 60.9 for Marcus Ambrose. They're the two quickest guys on the racetrack. Further down the order, Paul Wheel is 
has dislodged Jamie Wincup from the top 10. Wheel holds that position. Ahead of him, Tanda, Bright, Bow, Radisich, Scaife. And then we see this bunch, the familiar group at the front. Glenn Seaton has done well to claw his way back from a frustrating opening race. Seaton in the lead, Dick Johnson racing Falcon. He sits 12th ahead of Todd Kelly, who has also responded well from that major incident in the second race, and he leads Jason Richards and Rick Kelly. Fair bit of grip, you know, when you consider the lap speed they're doing at the moment, because a good lap time round here is, you know, on dry conditions with the used tyres of 56 or 57. They're doing 61s. They're not that much slower on these tyres, so there's a bit of grip available in that groove, but if you come out of it, it just looks like an ice skating rink, so heaven forbid if somebody makes a mistake, or if you tried to pass anybody, and that's the critical thing here. You might be able to get onto the back of another car. Lots of luck trying to get round him. Let's enjoy the ride with the big pond in car. Russell Ingle closing few laps. And if, if Greg Murphy can't get through this traffic effectively, this will allow Russell Ingle to close that gap. It's Greg Ritter immediately ahead. And this is what I was talking about. It's getting out of the groove that's hard. Murph will have to make a decision here. How much do I want to risk it? What's the margin? They'll be telling him on the radio. He'll be flashing the lights. And I'm sure FPR are telling Ritter, yes, they are. And he's got out of the way and given him a breather. So that's one down. And in fact, that's good news because it puts a car between he and Russell Ingle. But now that Greg Ritter's seen the traffic, he's aware of the leaders coming by. He has not been touched this weekend. For some reason, well not for some reason, for the obvious reason. It's his home race, he loves this place. Greg Murphy lifts an extra 10% when he comes to Pukekohe. He finds something special and he's produced it yet again. Jason Bright spoiled the party last year, but no one's done it to Greg Murphy this year. Final few corners. The super cheap auto racing pilot has done a superb job this weekend in the dry and in the wet. The fans raise, they cheer, they Whee! clap, they wave their flags. Good job, boy. Woo! Murphy yeah! takes the three-peat. Superb performance from Greg Murphy. Great work, man. Great work. Good driving all weekend. Yeah! Awesome. Bloody awesome. <laughs> 51, language please. Simple as that. <laughs> hey, he gets the $3,200 a night penthouse. He, uh, he did a great job, didn't he? In all conditions, all weekend, the car was excellent. Marcus made the best of a tough weekend. Keys wheel, the team owner, Mark Rowworth, the commercial director. Joe Sullivan in the mix there with all that crew. They can uh, take pride in that performance. And the Hogs Breath pick. There he is, the boss, Keys Wheel. Time to celebrate. He's been very impressed with his new recruit, and rightly so. Greg standing by. How good does that feel? How good does it feel? Yeah, no, it's not too bad. We've, uh, we've sort of come from where we left off at Adelaide and done a lot of homework and came here and tried to do our best, and Murph had two tents in the crowd that helped him, and uh, I guess that's a result, so it's just fantastic for the team. Geez, this has been a massive building progress over, or process rather, over the course of summer. Great, uh, great inroads you've made in the space of a handful of rounds. Yeah, no, we're, we're very happy how we, well, we're happy how, how we left off last year and we had a few people leave the team and what have you. So uh, now we regroup, put the team together and, and just a fantastic result. And the, you know, it's a credit to the team of what a job they've done and also Murph and Paul and everybody here is just fantastic. Go and enjoy. Super Cheap Auto Racing's Keys Wheel. Well, Ross, you do say what well, Jimmy said to me the other day, this place kind of eludes us a bit like Bathurst, but still a good result for Russell. Oh, yeah, it's good. You know, um, Murphy deserved to win. he done a great job all weekend. Their stops were good. And, um, you know, they just, just had the edge on us on a little bit, but um, we gave it our best shot. We've got two blokes on the podium, so I, I just think, you know, uh, Russell and Marcus both done a great job for us. What about Marcus' car over the weekend? There's been talk, you know, he's saying something's wrong with it, it's not right, it doesn't feel right, maybe a shock or chassis rah. What, what do you think it could be? Oh, I don't know. Um, I, I think it's under control. Um, time will tell. We'll have a good look when we get home, I guess. Um, we're working here this week, you know, because uh, the boat doesn't leave for a while, so, but we'll sort it out. I love it how you dodge my questions. Yeah, thanks, mate. Thanks, Ross. <laughs> There's the man, Greg Murphy, set to climb from his car 
to the enormous applause of this capacity crowd at Pukekohe. And they won't wipe the smile from that face for a while. 2000, rather 2001, 2002, 2003 he did it. Bright took the spoils last year, but in 2005, Murphy is again the man. Let's check the final results for you on the VB scoreboard. Murphy Ingle Richards, the podium in this final race, and Ambrose forced the issue there. Mark Scaife ahead of Paul Radisic, and further back, Jason Bright got by Bow, and Tanda, some relief at last for the big man, and Paul Wheel finishing in the top ten. Good solid result for Paul Wheel. That will keep him in and around the top five in the championship points. Win Cup again, a good result just outside the tent. And Seaton, that'll bring some relief to his effort as well. Yeah, it was frustrating for him yesterday to slip off on that oil. That kind of put paid to what could have been a better weekend. So 174 points apiece between Marcus Ambrose and Mark Scaife. But because Marcus was on top of Mark Scaife in this last race, he'll be the one that ends up being third on the day. Hard pace, but it looked like you just ran out of laps. Yeah, no, look, it's coming on good there. It's making a few um, adjustments to the to the Annie roll bars, and it was coming better and better and better and better. But um, look, that that's that's a great result considering where we were at the start of today. Um, we we'll grabbed some points. We've got a reasonably straight car, and um, you know, full credit to the Castrol guys. Just quickly, the line, the drying line. How was the car performing, and what was it like if you stepped off it? Uh, it was pretty slippery when you stepped <laughs> off it. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, like the first couple of laps was really like a, you know, you're, you're you're a bit of an explorer. You know, you're trying to find where the track had some grip and where it didn't. And um, you know, we started on brand new wets, which is also another bit of a drama. And so it was it was good though. Like once we got a few laps under our belt, the tyres come up to a bit of temp. We're allowed to sort of able to press on. Good luck in WA, Richard. Thanks. Duh. Paul, you've got to be pretty pleased with that. It's been a tough day with the conditions. Yeah, it sure has. We um, uh, were sort of talking, should we go slicks or not? And I, my past experience, experience around here with a cold day like this, it just it doesn't dry out. And sure enough, you know, at least at least the, they took the bumps out, but they didn't take away the uh, unpredictability of how fast it dries. But look, really pleased. Tim Kiwi did, did a great job this weekend. We, uh, pit stops are awesome. We just need a little bit more pace to keep up with the top guys in a straight line. And, you know, we'll, we'll work at it. And, and uh, I know Alan Draper will come up with, uh, with the goods for us during the season. Congratulations, Paul. Thanks, Darrell. Cheers, Paul. Very, very pleasing result for Paul Radisic and Team Kiwi Racing. But this guy, he owns the place. Greg Murphy drives around the track, waves to the crowd, thanks them for their support. And when we come back, we will wrap it up here at Pukekohe. That paints the picture perfectly, doesn't it? Welcome back to a very wet and dark Pukekohe Raceway. Time now for the podium presentation. Here's Greg Rust. Well, what a, a remarkable weekend, ladies and gentlemen. A race meeting finishing in the dark, but you have been treated to some fantastic motorsport right across the weekend for the Placemakers V8 International. We hope you've enjoyed it. And to say a few words as we commence the official trophy presentation, would you please make welcome Mr. Andrew Simcock, the General Manager Marketing for Placemakers International. What a weekend. Congratulations, Murph. You are a champion. Uh, thanks very much to the drivers and the teams for such a fabulous competition. Uh, on behalf of Placemakers, I'd really like to thank those at uh, Avesco, IMG, and all those at Pocket Co, including the fans, for just having a fabulous event. Um, we're actually in talks at the moment uh, with the organisers and hoping to have another Pocket Co event next year. So we'd love to be here 2006 at Pocket. Thank you very much, Andrew, and thank you for your support of this marvellous event. Third place for this round, the defending series champion on home turf for the Stone Brothers. Give it up for Marcus Ambrose. Well done, third place this weekend. Bit of a contrast to the opening round of the championship. There were some tough moments out on the track and I know the fans want to know what transpired through that first sequence of corners in that last race. Oh, well, it's just the first, uh, first corner of the race, you know. You things happen to you out there, there's no malice. Um, you know, we got done a raw deal there, and but we bounced back, we finished fourth in that race, and you know, the car was, was handling um, you know, pretty tough out there today, and I'm just really pleased we were able to get a podium. It's been a really hard weekend for us, and um, you know, I hope they're not all like this, but 
Oh, congratulate Greg. He's just driven faultlessly all weekend. Just quickly, a busy time coming up for you. You're about to jump on a plane, aren't you, to go to America? That's right, but I've uh, got to get there first. <laughs> there he is, Marcus Ambrose. Third place for the Placemakers V8 International. He'll collect the trophy from Andrew Simcock. We welcome second now for this round of the series, the enforcer, Russell Engel. Fantastic weekend you had, good car pace. It was a difficult start on Friday, but boy, you made amends for it Saturday, Sunday. No, really pleased with that car. We, we were struggling Friday, but the boys, SBR, typical, they got into it, gave me a real good car. I really like to thank the crowd. The crowd have been terrific since we've been here, and uh, this is why we come over here, because they're such great people. Uh, to Murph and his team, well done. We, uh, we couldn't get on his pipe this, uh, this weekend, so they did a great job. There he is, Russell Ingle, and good points for the 2005 championship. We welcome the undisputed king of Pukekohe from Super Cheap Auto Racing. He has done it again, ladies and gentlemen, Greg Murphy! before you got here this weekend that you would be on the top step of the podium? Oh, well, mate, to, to be completely honest, we're really confident coming here this weekend. Um, yeah, we didn't have a great run at Adelaide, but the car was really good on the Sunday before uh, we, we had a premature end of the race. And uh, we, were, we were pretty confident. I mean, a heap of people wrote us off this weekend, which I found to be pretty ridiculous. But, um, you know, we were confident. We came here. The car was great on Friday. And uh, all weekend, you know, we qualified well. We sh probably should have been on pole after the shootout, after I made a mistake. But, you know, I can't fault it. The guys have just uh, done an awesome job. It's, it's great to change teams and get back on the, on the podium so quickly. And I'm just stoked for everybody. And great for the fans. I can't believe you all stayed here. I can't hardly see you. But the uh, support has just been sensational, and um, you know, that, that, that makes the difference. Certainly does. There he is, Greg Murphy, winner once again at Pukekohe. Time to celebrate, and rightly so. There's Johnny Pinozzo and the rest of the Super Cheap Auto team. Congratulations to them, because Greg Murphy has done a stellar job this weekend, albeit ending in the dark. Look at the camera flashes. It's like a rock concert, and this guy is a rock star in New Zealand. A thrilling performance, and I know you're impressed, Neil. That was a very solid weekend's work. Well, it was great, wasn't it? From the first race, he just showed great speed, and it's always impressive when someone can get the job done in all conditions, including difficult ones. And at the end there, it doesn't get much tougher than that. A dry groove, super slippery outside that, and all three of those guys deserve high praise for their great performance this afternoon. A hard thing to do for Greg Murphy, given the pressure that's come on him because of his previous performances here. And here is the overall championship view after two rounds. 366 for Marcus Ambrose, 324 Russell Ingle. Paul Wheel, by virtue of great consistency in third place in the championship. And then uh, Craig Lowndes, Greg Murphy, pardon me, Mark Scaife, Paul Radisis, Jason Bright, Todd Kelly and Stephen Richards. Looking further down the order, Paul Morris, Glenn Seaton, Jamie Wincup, John Bauer, Rick Kelly, Steve Johnson, Garth Pander, Dumbrell, McConville and Winterbottom. That's the top 20. And trailing through the rest of the order. It's interesting that Paul Wheel's in third place at the moment. Just goes to show what you can achieve in this championship if you hang in there. Watch out here, mate. I think I'm a bit of a target with all these bikes. But... Watch out! <laughs> I told you. I'll start again, Gerald. Yes, no, don't push me, mate. Don't you push me, mate. <laughs> He's right. And he hunted me. He hunted me. He hunted me. He ticks me. Then it'll 
to shake it. Right, mate, we've got to go. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Gonna need a gap filler. Gonna need a puddle sucker too. Might also need a Jenny. And another Sanger. Whatever you need, Coats High has a million pieces of equipment. Call 13 15 52.